Hello and good afternoon to one and all. I, Dr. Asavri Savant, on behalf of Voice of Healthcare, welcome you all to Connected Health Summit on the occasion of World Health Day. For this live panel discussion, we would be talking about the future of healthcare. So in today's post-pandemic era, connected health and digital health tools play a significant role in enhancing patient engagement, patient access to care, and patient empowerment. Our main focus for this live panel discussion is to explore telehealth and remote health monitoring options in healthcare. Talking about the latest adoption of technologies to monitor patients for enhancing clinical outcomes. Our another main focus is to design digital habits and healthier outcomes and exploring how healthcare is delivered now and what lies in the future of connected health. So for this summit, we have leading experts here with us today who would be deliberating and engaging in impactful discussions to explore newer facets in connected health. Please allow me to welcome Dr. Vinod Reddy, who is the consultant of internal medicine at Manipal Hospital, Vartha Road. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Welcome. I welcome Dr. Nitin Yashas who is the consultant of medical oncology and hemato-oncology at Manipal Hospital, Sarjapur. Welcome, sir. Thank you, so, thank you so much. It's a privilege to be here on this panel. I also welcome Dr. Rajesh Halewar, consultant of interventional radiology at Manipal Hospital, Yashwantpur. Thank you, Dr. Sahari. Next, I welcome Dr. Abhijit Pograj, who is the consultant of endocrinology at Manipal Hospital, Hebel. Welcome, sir. Namaste, madam. I also welcome Dr. Abhinav Rena, who is the consultant of neurology at Manipal Hospital, Whitefield. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Thank you Asavri, for the introduction. Hello to all the panelists. Yes. So with that being said, and all our panelists here with us today, let us start this informative session. My first question would be to Dr. Vinod. Sir, what latest advances in patient health monitoring technologies have you adopted in your practice for delivering better and more efficient pre and post hospitalization care? Over to you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, one and all. Uh, so nowadays, but the, after the pandemic, uh, initially it, it was very tight for us to manage, and slowly we started adopting a, a few of the new technologies. And uh, uh, the most important uh, technologies are with the diabetes and hypertension management only we are seeing uh, regarding diabetes and uh, ambulatory the glucose monitoring and ambul ambulatory BP monitoring, all, all those things and all. And uh, basically, the uh, coming to gluco the glucose monitoring. Uh, that uh, about one of our uh, free freestyle uh, thing uh, which is available nowadays where we can fix off uh, one uh, the chip or the uh, arm and we can keep getting the uh, readings and uh, that can be the patient can share the, the, the those kind of readings uh, in, into our mobiles so uh, we can see the kind of fluctuations of sugars almost on minute to minute basis that uh, that one particular thing is uh, very useful for us and apart from that one uh, again BP monitoring also it's uh, very helpful because uh, when patient comes here, most of the times patient will be having that kind of white coat hypertension, uh, uh, where uh, the, as soon as a patient enters here because of physical exertion and uh, uh, in the process of walking, parking the vehicles and coming here and uh, climbing the stairs and all, and mentally also a little bit they'll be disturbed and uh, because of that one BP tends to be uh, tends to be showing little higher size. So uh, rather than that one, uh, if, if uh, they educate the patient. And uh, tell them to monitor at home daily three to four times, uh, and that will give us the, uh, the exact picture of in, uh, uh, the diurnal variation of the BP and which particular medication is acting well, and uh, uh, any uh, the, the reduction of doses or ch changes of uh, ch ch changing the schedule of the medications, all those things are going to be helpful. So these two are the most important things. Apart from that one, this uh, holter monitoring, anyways, we are we are using re re regularly. And um, yes, the, again, it's the sleep studies and holder monitoring and DC ECG monitoring. These are the few things uh, which we are using regularly in our practice for diabetes, hypertension, and uh, holder monitoring and sleep studies. 
that was so well explained sir thank you so much uh, and definitely i can see that continuous monitoring uh, would help uh, you know in enhancing the clinical outcomes post uh, care as well so my next question would be to dr nitin sir how can we gain a holistic view on the patient's cancer recovery journey and monitoring them uh, remotely for providing them with required support diet and essential information uh, i mean how can we have a more complete care provided to the patient with the help of these devices and how can we support them through these uh, latest advanced technologies and wearable technologies right. for providing them with essential sort of support post operative care Sorry, sir, you are on mute. So if you can unmute. Yeah, thank you for yes. that. So just to sort of briefly digress a bit here. Now, a person is termed a cancer survivor, actually, right from the time of diagnosis. And like you rightly mentioned, it is important to focus on all aspects of his or health from the beginning. And this is actually where telehealth and digitization is beginning to play a key role. Now, what is the most important aspect for us when we give chemotherapy or targeted therapy? is early reporting and monitoring of side effects and this is where apps and platforms are now becoming common for a key term which is known as pro or patient reported outcomes wherein the patients key in their sim uh, symptoms in this app and you have an algorithm to automatically guide them as to what needs to be done or when it is necessary to even contact us as care providers as the at the earliest now in fact there are a lot of studies which have been done and this is becoming important because in oncology we are now moving into an era of targeted therapy where we are even giving oral tablets indefinitely at times for patients with metastatic cancer in a stage four setting now what studies have also shown is that by using these sort of strategies where uh, dg health or with patient reported outcomes they not only impact in uh, helping us uh, sort of uh, uh, detect side effects early and prevent them from becoming a complication by either you know reducing the doses or by early initiation of supportive care but it also improves patient completing the treatment and treatment compliance which ultimately impacts the overall survival as such now as mentioned in your question also holistic is the right word to use and now we have a lot of studies and data which have shown that physical activity and exercises not only improve tolerance to therapy, but also play a lot of important role in reducing anxiety, depression, and in some types of cancer, even the risk of death from cancer. And this is where we may now be moving into a phase where we can make use of devices such as activity sensors, which would help us in getting a more accurate view of how a patient is doing post therapy, be it in terms of sleep, their vitals, their movements, and therefore we can even tailor what kind of physical activity they should do. And of course, even provide important nutritional counseling. Now, of course, uh, one advantage of the pandemic or the positive collateral of the pandemic was that telehealth consultation and virtual consultations began to increase. And therefore, for us as an oncology community, it became more uh, easy and even comfortable that we could sort of monitor the reports and everything online so that we could also minimize the visits of patients to the hospital and at the same time initiate early treatment when it is required. Thank you so much, sir. That was so comprehensively explained. Uh, and so easy to understand as well. And definitely we can see now the treatment protocol in India as well progressing, not just to uh, treatment, but to prevention and awareness and more holistic approach in every field, not just oncology. So that is great to know that such devices are supporting us at every step. My next question would be to Dr. Rajesh. Sir, Tele-radiology and AI-integrated imaging devices are the groundbreaking interventions in the field of radiology. How has it enhanced the clinical uh, outcomes in your experience with your patients? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Savari, for the question. So, tele-radiology has been there for quite some time, and I think it's <clears throat> one of the cornerstones of uh, telehealth. It's uh, not new, but uh, the, uh, there is increased acceptance uh, nowadays. And, uh, with, and with the availability of uh, high-speed broadband internet, it's made uh, its uh, reach even to Tier 2 and Tier 3 cities as well. 
So teleradiology itself means that a scan done or a CT or an MRI or an ultrasound done at one hospital is being read physically in a different uh, place. So how can this uh, help us or how is it already helping us? See, uh, as we know, the doctor population, doctor patient ratio in the country is skewed heavily towards the tier one uh, and metro cities. So in tier two cities or tier three cities, there is not enough knowledge pool to read these scans. So, but uh, the infrastructure for acquiring a scan is present in uh, many of these tier two and tier three cities. So in such scenario, the images are acquired and transmitted uh, to a teleradiology unit like uh, a Manipal Hospital Radiology Group, where these scans are read by specialists and uh, in a fraction of few minutes to uh, few, <coughs> these scans are read and reported back to the center. So these uh, scans um, are read and then uh, transmitted. So these tier two cities don't have to suffer from the lack of a radiologist. That's one thing. And also nowadays there is a <coughs> grouping of subspecialty uh, radiology reports, which even in tier one and metro cities are not accessible to many people. For example, let's say you need a to access a musculoskeletal radiologist or a cardiac radiologist. Uh, these are niche specialities which are not available easily. Uh, and uh, uh, so we can uh, report uh, for these niche specialities from a, a teleradiology group. Uh, not just that, uh, even in terms of hospital, uh, smaller hospitals in tier one and metro cities, they may not be able to uh, provide 24 bar 7 radiology coverage. So in this scenario, 24 bar 7 coverage can be provided to smaller hospitals by bigger hospital groups or bigger teleradiology groups like ours. And uh, uh, <clears throat> now we can harness the power of uh, being in the other side of the continent. And uh, uh, we also will be able to report for emergency uh, radiology coverage across the globe. Uh, that's also possible. Uh, coming to AI, uh, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence means that uh, the <clears throat> machine has been taught to detect abnormalities or pathologies on the scans. And uh, sometimes uh, it uh, uh, speeds up the process. For example, uh, during the COVID pandemic, we have seen that there is a huge amount of uh, burden on the uh, diagnostic community because uh, thousands of scans were performed. and uh, these scans, if read by humans, the, there will be a lot of fatigue and uh, burnout and there may be errors. So there were a lot of uh, AI developed the tools which you could detect the abnormalities on chest X-ray and CT. Not just detect these, but also quantify the amount of disease and can um, uh, <clears throat> triage the patients for who require admission, who require ICU care. Uh, coming to the non-COVID scenario, for example, let's say we have about 100 scans waiting to be read. And let's say the 90th patient is a gentleman with a, or a lady with a head injury and uh, intracranial bleed. So there may be uh, 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 consequences of not reading the scan quickly. So if you have an AI algorithm uh, which can pick up uh, emergent critical conditions, let's say, for example, there's an intracranial bleed. So if the AI can... Uh, at, uh, as of available today, can detect those bleeds and pop up that uh, critical case onto the top of your list so that you are delivering uh, care appropriately and as quickly as possible. Uh, so I think uh, the future is all about AI and uh, telehealth and teleradiology. Over to you, Dr. Asavari. Thank you so much sir, for sharing all these insights. Definitely, it was very... Um, um, a, a, a nice to hear all these things coming up now as well as for future as you shared emergency radiology coverage all across the globe is something very um, uh, tempting to hear in my opinion and especially uh, prioritizing the uh, need based cases um, uh, through ai technology and putting them on top and prioritizing the you know uh, high requirement cases first, then the other normal cases would definitely help and go a long way in future. So, uh, my let us move on to our next guest panelist, Dr. Abhijit. Uh, sir, my question to you is how can remote health monitoring devices such as smartwatches and such help in monitoring the re related vital signs of patients suffering with? 
endocrine disorders and common endocrine disorders such as diabetes and PCOS and such in your opinion and how can these devices help in that Over to very you. wonderful question madam and uh, uh, what we have to now start to bring into the highlight of everyone is uh, see everyone uh, most of the patients are using smart watches uh, they're using their mobile phones uh, to update their diet so when when we look at most of these endocrine disorders it is very much linked to the lifestyle for us as uh, treating doctors it became very hard for us to understand what is going on in their day to day routine and when you when you deal with uh, uh, you know when you're seeing a patient you 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 can spend maximum probably 10 minutes 15 minutes beyond that it becomes impossible for us to sit and going on hours together of what we require it takes around one and a half hours to actually sit and get a proper lifestyle history of our patients. And when you deal with diabetes, thyroid, PCOS, the link is your lifestyle. And how to understand this lifestyle is where the technology has had to come in. What we are doing at uh, Manipal Hebal is basically we had developed a personalized solution where we are able to track the lifestyle of our patients. And uh, using this customized application, what we have developed at Hebal, uh, we are now able to get inputs of the physical activity. The physical activity can come in from the steps from the uh, from a smartphone, or it can come in from any smartwatch. So that is one input. Second input that we are getting is photographs of food. So all the patient has to do is take the photograph of the food with the app that we have developed. And uh, this gets analyzed by our backend team, who's uh, looking at uh, the food data that is coming in. Uh, the third input that is coming in is what medication they're taking on a regular basis, whether they're regular with their medicines or not. And uh, and then we have self-reported data of symptoms, uh, sleep, mood, all these aspects. So when you put all of this information together, it is a large uh, amount of information we are getting. So just for vitals per se, let's just talk about the vitals. So the smartwatches also have a heart rate tracker and we're looking at heart rate variability. So when there is variability in the heart rate, then we know that there is some event that is happening. So because it is linked to the autonomic nervous system. So these are inputs that start to come in. And now when you're tracking multiple patients, so uh, uh, at any given time, we are looking at uh, 100 patients of, of uh, data uh, every month. So what now where technology is again coming in is all this data, once it comes in, it comes into our system. And this is analyzed and then then it goes to a level of intelligence and AI, which is big uh, pointing, you know, where the problem areas are, which patient needs to be addressed. And then the, the next important part of it is because you have this data, it can be shared across a care team. So that is how we are using these smart devices to collect information at home, linking it with groups of care team members. So because I, I can't do one single, I mean, I, I can't do all the job with regard to how the physical activity needs to be set, how the diet needs to be set. So the right person for the job is looking at the data that needs to be looked at. And uh, then we have care team members who is overall looking at what needs to be done for the patients. So then your outcomes also become better. You're getting better care. The patients have, uh, you know, they have a link with the hospital and with the uh, with the teams that are providing uh, health so especially for lifestyle we have designed this program and it is it's been now running for the past two years successfully and uh, we are seeing excellent outcomes when you, when you just look at a1c outcomes almost in a three month period we are uh, in somebody who's poorly controlled almost 1.7 percent which is actually extremely uh, that is when we talk about digital therapeutics here we're not adding more tablets so we're able to get the a1c down by a good and a significant uh, uh, you know uh, level and so that is where uh, these smart devices smart watches uh, the information that they collect is now helping us understand our patient much better and our care uh, becomes much more easy and uh, uh, it saves us time because we are able to now uh, get this information in a in a structured manner and we are using this information to uh, help our patients better so that's how we've been doing it 
Thank you, sir, for so nicely explaining the entire flow. And we can definitely see such devices being so essential in uh, monitoring the lifestyle and the entire conditions of the patients suffering with different endocrine disorders because mainly they are lifestyle related, as well as uh, it is so efficient and streamlined the way you explained the processes to be working and i feel the care delivered with these devices would be so much more efficient as compared to future definitely oh, so moving on to our other guest panelist dr abhinav sir can you please explain me and the viewers what dbs is and how is dbs monitored in neurology with the help of remote technology and what all other parameters can be monitored with the help of these such variable health monitoring devices for improving the overall health of the patient suffering with neurological conditions. Over to you, sir. Hi, Asnapuri. Yeah, so uh, DBS is a quite a complicated uh, thing for people to understand. Let me just uh, briefly explain uh, for want of time. So deep brain stimulation, that is VBS, is basically a, a, it's a complicated device which has an electrode and an impulse generator. The electrode is placed deep inside the brain and uh, the electrode has a contact and there is a neural uh, stimulation interface which is there and the current uh, and that electrode is connected uh, through, to the impulse generator and, and that impulse generator is generally located at the chest. And uh, the impulse generator uh, gives electrical signals and certain areas in the brain are stimulated. This DBS is particularly used in neurology in patients with Parkinson's disease, in patients with dystonia, in patients with tremors, and also in psychiatry with, uh, with in certain cases like severe refractive obsessive compulsive disorders. Now, uh, there was a major problem of patients with Parkinson's disease who had undergone a DBS during the lockdown because uh, you require frequent post uh, on follow up post operative uh, monitoring as well as reprogramming of the uh, impulse generator. You need to change the settings. So during the lockdown for them coming every two, three months, particularly them having a problem, it was a big problem for them coming here. Uh, so what uh, we as neurologists used to do is do a teleconsult. We would ask them to record uh, their videos on the app, on the Manipal app, which we have, uh, during when they were in on stage, when they were in off stage. And uh, by themselves, we would ask the family members or the patients themselves to, with the programmable probe, to change the settings. Now, the settings can be done in a... Uh, in a certain range of hand, but essentially requires uh, patients coming to the hospital if major settings are done. Um, but still, we would manage by doing uh, minor changes. We would ask the patients themselves to do through the programmable probe to change the settings. Um, recently, uh, this is a major issue for them to come again and again uh, to the hospital. Uh, particularly if they are living in uh, uh, different cities. A DBS is not available in tier two, tier three cities, only in tier one, few tier one cities. And patients who are getting uh, this uh, DBS done, it's a big issue for them coming to the city again and again. So uh, there are certain uh, 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 companies like uh, Scenery, they have made this wireless DBS uh, uh, reprogramming system where the once the DBS is installed you can through a, a video system you can reprogram the doctor is sitting in his hospital and you can reprogram the dbs uh, uh, and uh, without the patient having the need to change and patient is sitting in their room uh, dedicated video equipment system is there they record their videos and we sitting live do a direct uh, ma manipulation of the programming and the time delay is less than a few seconds. Huh? Even more so, uh, uh, nowadays, adjustable or closed loop deep brain stimulations are in the pipeline. Already a uh, study has been published which has shown the real time validity. These are uh, the electrodes, uh, the conventional one, the, uh, the electrode is connected through the wire to the impulse generator. These are wireless transmissions. So through the Bluetooth, the electrode is giving 
all the readings uh, it's a bidirectional flow normally the electrode is also recording as well as stimulating and through that bidirectional flow of information is going to the computer tablet and that uh, through the artificial intelligence algorithm is uh, a pre-designed algorithm is automatically adjusting the uh, impulse generator settings which are which are not in the uh, the skin but um, patient is wearing it like a jacket so uh, this will revolutionize the deep brain stimulation methodology so it's an ai which is being used to serve in off stages the impulse is increased uh, the the frequency the voltage stimulation parameters are increased when in the off they are reduced. So this is all AI de- generated and this will be very sophisticated and uh, new age technology will be coming. Uh, in addition to DBS, um, even patients with Parkinson's disease without DBS. So uh, teleconsultation was the major methodology. They would upload and in the app, they would have this uh, uh, via app. We could even measure their uh, intelligence. We could measure their executive functioning. We could measure their non-motor symptoms also through questionnaires. And through video recording, we, we could assess the disability and modify the medicines. Um, mm-hmm. There are other uh, uses in neurology of this home-based wearable devices. Uh, particularly so, we have been uh, advocating their use in patients with dementia. We have these smart wrist watches, which can measure the uh, distance they have walked, which can measure the step length, stride length, which can give us information about their motion tracking. Uh, these devices can also uh, measure the sleep, the the the, uh, the sleep pattern, whether they are in non-REM sleep, REM sleep. There are also devices which can measure the circadian rhythm. So uh, these basically use the accelerometer or motion sensors or gyroscopic techniques. Uh, so the, we have exploited these devices in dementia. We have exploited these devi- their use of devices in uh, sleep-related disorders. And also lately in epilepsy, uh, seizure forecasting and detection. These are non-EEG-based devices, again, uh, patient having a generalized tonic-clonic seizure or major attack, uh, these non eeg based devices will pick up the motion and uh, one can identify the seizures and uh, immediate uh, SMS or uh, emergency message can be sent to the family members or to the hospital that, and a patient is having a seizure and some intervention can be done. These methods have also helped us in identifying, maintaining a seizure diary and which on subsequent follow-up we have been able to uh, manage the patients better, right? Thank you so much, sir, for so nicely explaining it in and in so simple words. Definitely, uh, this sounds very interesting to me personally. Uh, and all the technology that you have shared, the information, as well as uh, technology for seizure forecasting is definitely something I see and I foresee coming becoming very popular in the hindsight. So uh, moving on to our next question is for uh, it, which is for Dr. Vinod. Sir, uh, in your practice and your experience, we uh, you must or have seen that people not, you know, come people coming for treatment starting with the treatment, but somehow they're not able to complete the entire treatment cycle. They And with uh, pandemic era, we uh, most of the people who were not uh, suffering from COVID were not able to get in touch with doctors and somehow lacked the entire treatment cycle. And it got, you know, it did not get completed. So how in your experience can such smart healthcare devices help clinicians in enabling the completion of prescribed pre- treatment cycle for patients? As you, uh, as we know, uh, some of the diseases such as TB, et cetera, have very long treatment cycles. So how can such devices be helpful in, you know, st- making patients stick to a completion of the treatment cycle? Over to you, sir. Yeah, <clears throat> because of this pandemic, uh, usually because of lack of follow-ups, uh, especially this diabetes, hypertension, and other uh, hypothyroidism, all those things and all, 
uh, patients were never were not uh, able to come for follow up and uh, in, in between the few patients have stopped uh, taking medications also and since this diabetes and hypertension mild to moderate rise of uh, bps and sugars we will not see in 80 to 90% of the time we will not see much of symptoms so so since there is no not much of symptoms so patients uh, will feel that uh, there is a uh, sugar and bp are under control so the, they may either discontinue the medications or they may they, they may not come for regular follow up all those things and all so the in, the, in that way the regular monitoring of sugars and bps through the glucometer and of home bp monitoring usually we will give them the picture where where, where they stand basically and uh, that will make them to come for follow up at least for the, if if at all they doing the uh, peak phase of uh, covid pandemic at least they can manage to uh, go for a tele consultation with one of us and that is where uh, really that will be really helpful coming to tuberculosis uh, um, yes tuberculosis the, the regarding the, the complications and adverse reactions of medications uh, and uh, that particular thing usually uh, we, we we could manage through tele consultations on and all, almost like two to three weeks once or uh, monthly ones and uh, uh, with, with regular follow ups so, uh, somehow they they could uh, complete the complete the course of treatments thank you so much sir mm. yeah so that crisply answered my question so my next question is to dr nitin sir what all that what all are the areas in oncology care that you see uh, still lack improvement or where all do you see are there are still gaps in the oncology care and where all can we use such digitalized health ecosystem uh, devices and digital health uh, devices uh, to leverage and create an impact and somehow fulfill those gaps in onco care over to you sir uh, so i think uh, the theme of this year's uh, world cancer day was uh, close the gap and i think that if you are talking about uh, impact one area which really needs a big push in our country is screening for early detection which also translates into better outcomes and cure as such and more so more in the tier 2 tier 3 cities and in fact more in the rural areas as such so we need to have a more encouragement of innovations particularly let's say portable devices or handheld devices for something like a breast cancer screening or screening and examination of the oral cavity and these images can then be transmi transmitted via a cloud based format for a higher referral center for further interpretation now this is almost uh, happening uh, as we speak in terms of uh, mammogram and all that and as dr uh, uh, rajesh was uh, saying there is a definite uh, uh, increase in the impact of artificial intelligence and worldwide they are now talking about using artificial intelligence for uh, uh, interpretation of mammogram or ct scans of lung for early detection of cancer so really trying to use a digitalized health ecosystem for screening is one area which really needs a big thrust in our country now also you have a uh, telehealth consultation which i have already mentioned has moved by leaps and bounds but we still need to make strides in other area for example let's say digitization of uh, slides and uh, biopsy samples so that uh, second opinions are possible even in another higher referral center without actually the time delay that it takes to transport these blocks as uh, uh, such uh, and also uh, personally i feel that we sort of need to do more in terms of support to doctors working in rural or primary health centers or centers where really a full-time oncologist is not available by trying to have a digital platform where it is easy to share clinical data real time and have access to patients virtually in a real time so that it's not only diagnosis of cancer which we can try to do early but also once treatment is completed at a tertiary care center we can ensure that post treatment care and a continuum of care can be done in a coordinated manner which would not only translate to better outcomes but also patients start becoming more compliant to treatment and begin to accept treatment more in a friendly manner thank you sir that those were some very golden concepts that you shared with us today
aptly moving on to dr rajesh as uh, dr nitin uh, shared with us that there is a big need for early detection and on the spot remote detection devices for different diseases including cancer so sir uh, just for, out of my curiosity in future where do you see the such devices and how portable they can actually be wherein you are getting specialized uh, you know uh, inputs from the specialist uh, for detection but the device being completely remote so that uh, the detection can happen from house of the patient itself or from then and there itself so just being curious over to you sir yeah uh, that's an excellent uh, <coughs> question uh, so remote diagnostic devices now what we talk about in tele radiology is reading of an acquired scan now coming to acquiring the scan remotely for example uh, the traditional way how an ultrasound for example uh, ultrasound or a mammogram is done is the ultrasound is done by a radiologist or a sonologist and read by him uh, there is another way where a sonologist acquires the images and transmits it to a uh, radiologist and he signs off so <clears throat> this is a, a remote a remotely done ultrasound read by a radiologist later so there is a new development called a robotic ultrasound which is uh, which is in the pipeline and i think you don't need a radiologist to be present in the room so a uh, robot does the ultrasound just like we have robotic surgery robotic ultrasounds are available and uh, with uh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> with time in the next few years we will see that coming into reality and uh, but uh, as of now ct and mri are not uh, very uh, mobile devices uh, unlike x-rays and ultrasound so there is some progress in terms of uh, portable equipment in both of these but uh, none of them are uh, yet being widely clinically used i think this will uh, in the next decade we will see all of them becoming the devices becoming smaller portable and uh, more uh, user friendly over to you dr savri so uh, continuing on with your answer only so what kind of impact did remote radiology tools in uh, such uh, including ultrasound probes application for uh, play for diagnostic imaging during the coronavirus pandemic that you observed in your uh, clinical experience thank you so during the coronavirus pandemic uh, um, you as you know most of the technology companies Uh, adopted a work from home model so our tele radiology and radiology services were all being hospital centric and we were providing all these services from the hospital and uh, as you know because we had to follow all these um, social <coughs> distancing guidelines and mask being masked up all the time so being in a hospital uh, uh, and following social distancing was uh, quite difficult and in fact uh, suddenly we adapted to this new work from home model because radiology is predominantly technology based uh, at least the reading part of it the reading of the scans part of it and uh, surprisingly all of us have adapted it uh, so well and uh, now i think we are also exploring if like many other technology companies uh, if work from home model uh, is a viable um, a model wherein we can read these scans safely from our comforts of our home um, especially in these days when the traffic uh, uh, traveling times and traffic are extremely huge so uh, now most of our work is happening fr uh, from home um, and uh, i think this is the way forward uh, for the <clears throat> uh, technology adaptation into radiology thank you so much sir moving on to dr abhijit sir as you shared with us that remote monitoring devices for de detecting uh, lifestyle uh, related disorders and endocrine disorders are uh, playing very big part in you know proper monitoring of patients throughout and uh, uh, through the data that you have studied so far through these devices what do you feel areas that we can develop better habits for such patients with uh, you know endocrine related disorders or uh, you know specific habits that you observe commonly occurring in uh, patients suffering from you know diabetes or pcos or thyroid for example and where all we can improve 
in uh, terms of habit so that the overall outcomes of uh, such treatment and our you know surveillance and monitoring uh, comes out so i guess i'll just uh, yes, say yes, it no. again in brief no no problem madam um, i got it yeah so yes so how so, uh, through yeah sorry through the data that you collected using... yeah yes. how can we improvise and what all tips that you would suggest so that we can have a better outcome in our uh, you know patient care so using the uh, seven sugar platform like what i was describing what we were using in herbal um, let's talk about a particular scenario about eating patterns and because i didn't stress enough about that so what i as i said all the uh, the person with diabetes or uh, thyroid has to do uh, or pcos has to do is take a photograph of their food so what we had seen okay there are quite a lot of people start their day early and they wake up and they check their blood glucose early in the morning when they wake up and uh, uh, their blood glucose level is absolutely normal when we started to use the cgm sensors and we started to you know asking them to uh, uh, check their blood glucose more uh, in a set pattern form of way we started to see multiple spikes that were coming and the morning fasting is normal they're having their coffee uh, and whatever morning snack and they're not telling us what they're having so we are seeing the the readings come in from the cgm device we see those spikes that are coming which are not normal and uh, then we get into conversation because we are detecting these spikes using the the sensors that we are getting then we are getting the getting into the conversation and then the photograph of the food also is there so when when we ask when we used to take a diet recall they don't describe their uh, the their exact eating pattern so it becomes difficult for everyone to articulate so well so looking at their plate of their food it became much more easy for us so using these learnings so like as i was mentioning in the morning time so the having the coffee majority of the people they overdo the biscuit and uh, they taking rust so all of these are maida or they have two slices of bread they think that these foods have less amount of uh, calories or less amount of sugars but when it when maida is a refined food when we are seeing these photographs we outright know uh, uh, that you know there are variations so we have these correlations already the reports are there in the system saying that the a1c is high and uh, so and when we are saying we're seeing this uh, food photographs eating patterns are wrong then uh, we are using this information again to uh, help them understand what is to be done so we're not saying don't eat anything we're telling but this is how much you need to restrict so same with even the major meals combining a fruit with a major meal so the ai systems is detecting now the photograph is coming in the 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 ai system is detecting carbs it's detecting protein it's detecting all the fiber what is there my, uh, micro and macronutrients and it is also detecting if there is a fruit also that is there when you combine fruit with a major meal there is most uh, uh, good chances that you are again going to get higher blood glucose levels without you doing a test we can tell that yes this is a chance of this going higher so that is how we are starting to understand eating patterns eating styles of people and uh, quite a lot of uh, 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 you know we, uh, we in in south india we eat uh, we eat uh, you know raw kind of uh, atta so we, we talk of ragi ball what we say and it can be either wheat or it could be ragi so again the quantity people think that they are eating less when we see the actual uh, portion size of what they are eating same with even a bowl of rice they say i am eating only one bowl but actually that one bowl could be larger than what we are recommending and again there is an imbalance bit uh, in their food they'll only eat uh, certain types of uh, uh, carbohydrate or you know high high gi type of food without adding the protein or the fiber so when we start looking at data of the food patterns you know that the, this is already there so uh, the algorithms have been coded to tell you there's high fiber low uh, uh, low fiber high carb so all these patterns of what they have eaten has already been analyzed by an ai system now this is shifted to the diet team who is looking at series of patients who are they are monitoring so 10 patients have eaten uh, high carb food so they know exactly what to do they can do a quick message saying that okay reduce this quantity increase this add this uh, so it's simple conversations like that when you start when you learn about the patients and the important thing is once patient is sharing information with you and you don't give any feedback then that is where the uh, the whole the system doesn't uh, you know end up being useful 
so that is how we have designed it we we get information we learn and then we give feedback once you do this kind of methodology the data what people are sharing becomes more and more uh, you know they become more and more uh, 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 they start sharing a lot more so what uh, what we in the beginning when we started to say this is how you have to do this is the kind of program you need to follow we need so many uh, glucose readings at home uh, they started to understand why is this uh, person telling us to do so many tests and then when we started to paint the picture for them this is what we have understood this food is working for you this is your body reacting to this much of uh, eating this kind of food so then then they start to understand yes this is important the next again challenge is to get them to do this again and again so for a follow up visit also uh, we we needed them to do this and uh, so then they'll ask me the same thing sir i'm eating the same thing why do you want me to send the photograph of the food i'm saying every 4 to 6 months your body is going to age so today how your body is reacting may react in a different way after 6 months so i need to make the same comparison if you're eating the same thing i need to see if the body is going to be reacting in the same way so then i know you're in a steady state so so then they begin to understand okay so that's why we are taking the photographs that's why we have to share this data and this data is being looked at it we are getting feedback immediately and uh, so that is how the whole engagement is happening and that is how we are using uh, the data now let look at fitness for example so it doesn't one one aspect is being physically active also being physically inactive in a 2 to 3 month 2 uh, to 3 week period also physical inactivity will start to make the blood glucose change or we will start to see changes in other parameters and so that uh, so that again we can there's a automated system that will you know kind of uh, help the user understand the they've been you know the inactivity is uh, uh, lesser than what it was you know the previous week so this is what you need to do come back to your normal routine so by by alerting uh, them helping them understand giving feedback to what we have learned uh that is where the engagement starts to improve that is where the care the care delivery also starts to improve so that is how we have been using the data and giving feedback also and uh, helping our uh, users who been who been on our platform answer this is such a holistic way of treatment as well that without uh, changing the medication without uh, adding on any more medication or reducing anything we are just constantly monitoring and monitoring very effectively and getting the results that we require and throughout all this process it's not just the gaps that we are fulfilling that where you went wrong and what exactly caused this Uh, you know spike in your blood sugar for example we are also um, uh, you know making the patient educated towards his own health he is also understanding better that what all habits that he is having is leading to this sort of reasons and what all good habits that he can you know develop for healthier outcomes so definitely it is very holistic way and with uh endocrine disorders uh i suppose a pcos in indian females is uh every 60 60% of indian females suffer from pcos and uh, the same prevalence goes with diabetes and other thyroid uh, hypothyroidism other hormone related disorders the numbers are also very high so i can definitely see such technologies being adopted greatly on a wider scale in the coming years of course and being so effective that without having to modify or adjust your medications just through lifestyle changes and efficient monitoring you are able to get those sort of healthy results in your uh, uh, body so moving on to dr abhinav sir you very aptly explained what bbs is and how remote uh, technology is working in neurology and care uh, can you now identify us where the gaps still exist where all we have scope for improvement for using such uh, efficient health monitoring devices in neurological conditions and what uh, advancements do you foresee in neurology care with these devices in future mm -hmm. okay uh, see the penetrance of this mobile health devices in the field of neurology has not been very extensive they're not being extensively being used 
the problem with these devices is their reproducibility, their consistency. Say, for example, previously I told in Caesar prediction model, some devices are showing high sensitivity but poor specificity. So alarm keeps going on. You are not missing out on seizures, but you are picking up non-seizure events that is increasing the blood pressure of the relatives and all. Same way in the sleep-related disorders, when we are using actigraphy, which has a potential to replace polysomnography, uh, but then it has its fallacies, it has its shortcomings. It can't be used in certain kind of disorders like restless leg syndrome, where it can uh, wrongly uh, interpret the, uh, the disorders. Uh, so these devices still need advancement in technology. They need uh, more sophistication. They need more uh, better AI uh, prediction. For that, I think the 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 essence is the more and more data, more and more information, more and more uh, parameters are required, and uh, uh, data points are required for the technology sector to create better healthcare devices. Uh, but that said and done, the more uh, use of uh, this uh, health, uh, these devices. Uh, has the frequent use has to be validated uh, through uh, re, uh, this uh, state of the art research studies and uh, the device usage in real time environment and their effect on the outcomes of patients have to be documented through the research studies before more wider application or usage of these devices happen. Um, we are using more and more devices in the stroke, uh, particularly continuous uh, non-cuff BP monitoring, which is uh, preferred by the patients. Along with that, uh, extended loop recorders for a month or so to detect atrial fibrillation. Uh, we have been implicating the uh, the 3D um, this um, what we call it. Um, uh, 3D devices, the visual devices, huh? virtual 3D devices, which uh, sort of uh, uh, they uh, produce an immersive uh, art, uh, this artificial reality, and they can help calm the dementia patients now. They have these uh, these dementia patients have these agitated spells, and you just put in a 3D uh, virtual reality uh, goggle in front of them, and they tend, and which uh, plays the old experiences which they have had, and they can help them calm them down. Um, but that said and done, uh, it's still a long way to go for the more frequent use of devices. Uh, we, uh, the technology sector has to innovate, adapt, particularly in neurology, it is very difficult to get the data points. And uh, a, But we need to keep pushing our boundaries. Huh? Telemedicine is here to stay, here to change, and uh, patients want them to get treated by sitting at home. I think we have to adapt and adjust to the new normal. That's Thank I you guess. so much, sir. Definitely. Uh, and I believe personally, identifying the gaps is the first step towards eliminating those gaps in future. So definitely now we know that we lack precision and we lack accuracy uh, to some extent for neurological uh, detection devices. So definitely there, uh, after identifying such gaps, we can work on improving and eliminating them as well. I personally am very interested, although I'm a dentist and a public health specialist, but I'm very tech savvy sort of person. So I can also observe in my uh, iPhone uh, the sleep quality getting detected differently from my smartwatch, which is of a different brand. So definitely precision and accuracy is something that we do still require in such devices. And that would come as and when we advance. So the um, uh, ending uh, with uh, this uh, question that I am really interested in asking is, if resources, and this is for all our panelists, I would ask you one by one the same question. So on the occasion of World Health Day for this Connected Health Summit that we have today, uh, if resources such as money and time were not the constraints, what sort of device and what sort of, um, you know, um, result you would want from a wearable device in your field? So it is an hypothetical question, 
and uh, it also gives us a scope for uh, creating such sort of device in future but if resources such as time and money were not the constraints what sort of wearable wireless remote monitoring device in your field you would want to have so starting on with uh, dr reddy sir Sir, you are on mute. Can you please unmute? Yeah. Yeah, as long as the uh, research are not, not a concern, continuous glucose monitoring uh, device are, uh, will be very helpful to the patient where they can almost like see the graphs of uh, uh, sugar level fluctuating uh, right from minute to minute. And uh, that will give, give us a clear, clear picture of in, uh, after which particular meal. That particular uh, sugar levels are increasing or decreasing, all those things and all. And after the either medications or insulin, uh, what is the trend of uh, sugar? Uh, the sugar levels decreasing, other kind of information uh, will be available. So continuous glucose monitoring is the one thing which I would wait to see where, where everyone can use the regularly. On the same topic, moving on to Dr. Abhijit. as he already shared us uh, many latest inventions that are going on so sir uh, same question to you again the last question for this session so, if resources such as money and time were not the constraint what sort of uh, remote monitoring device you would want to have in your field so definitely a device which is non invasive i'm able to get all the required data points that is uh, you know important for all specialties it should not be very specific to one so non invasive and the ability to collect uh, you know important uh, points for uh, for uh, you know monitoring health for all specialties so that is also one more uh, requirement and the ability to tell you what is right and wrong in an instance so these are three important requirements for this device and uh, so if that device is able to do all of this and not being you know probed inside or you know uh, pushed inside then it will be one of the most uh, successful devices that we have so so it is also learning about you by and also telling you giving you feedback what is right and wrong uh, by itself so that is what a device uh, you know if there was no money uh, constraint that is what a device should be made out of uh, to made to be designed so so for now we feel like uh, it sounds more like aladdin's magic lamp to me no let's say this dream <laughs> about it so that's important But definitely so, if we can envision it we can have yes. it in future so yeah. definitely something to work for and uh, so the same question to dr nitin sir uh, uh, the same question goes to you if money and time and resources were not the constraint what sort of uh, 100% wireless remote monitoring device a wearable device you would want to have in your field no i think not only in my field i think uh, uh, we would be entering the world of isaac asimov and thinking of one device you wear it like iron man on your um, chest or you wear it like a watch it gives you pulse bp ecg eeg and who knows sometimes even the genetic information to see whether any genetic mutations like brca is there but on a more realistic note in the short term future i think for us it's very important that we have devices which sort of give us how a patient is doing post chemotherapy especially if they develop fever to send out alerts to the caretaker and the healthcare provider and also maybe if the device at the same time we are able to get at the point cbc uh, the complete blood counts to see if febrile neutropenia is being done so something which can be done at home itself would be one thing that i would envision and the second most important thing and again it's not more of a device and i'm pretty sure we will have apps or platforms doing it pretty uh, soon to send out reminders about screening screening for breast cancer cervical cancer or colorectal cancer just by knowing the demography of the person saying this person is this age or due for a screening right now and more importantly i think it's very important in our country to have regional language uh, to be delivered via these devices because that is something which we are missing out we all have enough of english language which the people in the urban areas will be able to get but to sort of send out this information in a regional language content will be uh, something feasible and which is very something workable which i hope companies would look forward to doing 
definitely sir very crucial points that you shared out and definitely i feel the voice would be heard by uh, proper uh, organizations who are working in this field and we would be able to have these devices in no time uh, uh, moving on the same question to dr rajesh sir if resources were not the constraint what sort of device you would want in your field so this is like a sci-fi device. Yes. <laughs> so for example, when you start uh, chemotherapy for a patient with, for example, let's say liver tumor. So you would uh, generally wait for a month or a month and a half or a couple of months before you actually see if the treatment has worked or not worked. Uh, and uh, I, I would uh, think of a wearable device that could actually tell you uh, if the uh, treatment, uh, the lesion in the liver or any other organ is responding to this treatment. If there is change in the um, temperature or the uh, how it feels um, or how the blood flow if any remote device can tell or give us an indication that if the treatment is working and we can continue with the same or if a device can tell us if this treatment is not working we need to change the gears and uh, change an alternative treatment uh, something that can do all this without um, added radiation uh, would be wonderful Amazing. That was so thought. I, I, I just got a point and yes. Dr. Rajesh was telling <laughs> we have something called circulating tumor cells uh, where uh, we say that the cells in the blood come down after every treatment. If we can have a device like Dr. Rajesh was saying, which can give us actually a graphical representation uh, like a TV or a video phone where we are seeing tumor cells coming down just by wearing one device. I think that would be fantastic. I think we are looking at uh, something which is going to happen in 2075. <laughs> okay. Sir, I genuinely hope that we have it before 2075, but let's try our best. Same question to Dr. Abhinav. Sir, if resources were not the constraint, what sort of device you would want in your field, which is, uh, you know, wearable and remote in nature? No, sir, I'll, I'll just uh, second all the panelists have said it. So uh, as a patient, uh, I would want all my physiological parameters to be recorded and be there for the doctor so that he can take the best possible decision. So a device easy to use, measuring all the possible potential parameters and, uh, and with a certain accuracy. Particularly with respect to neurology, the immediate uh, challenge which is coming is getting a reliable uh, home-based EEG monitoring, huh? which is easy to use, uh, which is not uh, causing, uh, uh, which is free from artifacts. That's a big challenge uh, people are trying, uh, but uh, this is the immediate in the down in the few years challenge, but uh, human computer interface is going to be the next big thing. And the next revolution is there for us to see in the next 50 to 100 years, I guess. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our esteemed panelists for being so uh, interested in this topic and taking out your valuable time to be with us today on World Health Day. Uh, I feel all the points that were discussed are definitely the future of connected health in India and in the entire world. And that good information and knowledge were shared today for our viewers as well. So to close off this very insightful session, I thank all the panelists i thank manipal hospitals all our viewers as well for staying to with us till the end i wish you all a very happy world health day and i sign off now saying stay happy stay safe and stay healthy thank you so much thank you all thank you thank you all